Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 89 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So I had such a great discussion with Natalie Adams for this episode, and Natalie is the teenage founder of a website called Teenage Grief Sucks, which you can find at TeenageGriefSucks.com. Terrific URL she's got there. We really had a great discussion. Natalie lost her dad when she was in high school, and she was having trouble finding online peer resources for and by teenagers. Uh, where teenagers could really feel less alone in their grief and and connect with others and read stories and experiences of someone in a similar situation as themselves. So she decided to go ahead and start the website, Teenage Grief Sucks, and uh, we talk all about that in this episode. And I was really glad to talk to her today for a number of reasons, one of which is that this is now, it's November, it's Children's Grief Awareness Month, which of course is Children and Teenagers Grief Awareness Month, which is so important. It's a topic that, um, well, it obviously gets a lot of attention on this show. And I think with the pandemic and the increased attention and and awareness on on grief, it's something that's getting um, more focused these days. But something that I think, uh, you know, could use a lot more awareness raising. So I hope you will uh, stay tuned for more on Children's Grief Awareness Month this month, including I'm doing a new a daily series of called Widowed Parent Podcast Live. And I'm interviewing different people who run different grief programs and resources. So uh, have a look out for that. But in the meantime, uh, in this is the first regular episode of this month with Natalie Adams from Teenage Grief Sucks, and I hope you enjoy our discussion. The Widowed Parent Podcast is supported by Audible, and I'm excited to say that listeners can get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial. Just go to audibletrial.com slash widowedparent. That's audibletrial.com slash widowedparent, and you get a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial of Audible. I hope you'll check it out. My guest today is Natalie Adams. Natalie is a high school student who has created an amazing website called Teenage Grief Sucks. Natalie, welcome to the show. Hi, Jenny. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Well, you know, I've really been looking forward to speaking with you. And I think this is just perfect because November is Children's Grief Awareness Month. And uh, so this episode is running the very first Wednesday of November. And of course, it's called Children's Grief Awareness, but it's really children and teenagers. So so this is going to be perfect. So thank you for doing this. Um, I want to hear all about your website, but first, um, let's learn a little bit about you. Can you tell us just a little bit about your life when everything was normal, before your dad died? So before my dad died, I was just weeks into my first year of high school. Um, High school is always a weird time for kids' lives just because it's this big, overwhelming change, and there's so much more stress and pressure and everything. And I began all of that while my dad was sick. Now, when I say my dad was sick, I didn't really think of him being as being sick at the time. To me, it was like he had a cold, except it was a really bad cold that just never seemed to go away. And even though I didn't really realize how like bad things were, still part of me knew, which made the time very stressful and upsetting. Since my parents were divorced, I already and I already spent most of my time at my mom's house. Um, I often just ended up staying with her and not going to see my dad because he was busy um, and in and out of the hospital. So I was going into high school. My home life was different just because I didn't see my dad, and it was a tough time. And I feel like that's hard to say because a lot of people tend to romanticize the time before the person died. It's easier to say, "Oh, things were amazing," and then they went really south than it is to say oh things were hard and then they got a lot worse yeah yeah okay and and then he died you said you were a few weeks into high school so you were how old? I was 14 14 14. gotcha just starting ninth grade okay um so I'm curious about your website then um why why did you start it So like many teenagers, I spend a lot of time online and it's sort of always been the place I went to for answers. So when my dad died, it was logical to my mom and I that we look online for resources for grieving teens. It took a long time for us to find some even decent resources, which was surprising then. And 
even though I did end up finding some amazing ones, they all had one thing in common. They were written by adults. And uh. while an adult's perspective is really helpful and learning the facts of grief, especially from experts, was essential to helping me get through the first moments of grief. Just, I'm, it's okay that I'm feeling this and, oh, this is normal and all of this stuff. But at the same time, what I needed the most was peer support. And I was surprised I could never find that online. And Mm. one day I started thinking, you know, um, before my dad died, we had been working on this blog together for me and I enjoyed writing fiction. So I was going to post some fictional work, but then when my dad died, that kind of, I came up, I kind of gave up on that. And I started thinking, you know, I love writing and I've never really written about my life, but I could, and I could design another website and I could write about my grief. So I decided to do that and I created the grief resource I needed. And in March of 2020, I released Teenage Grief Sucks. Wow, okay, March of 2020. And as we're talking, it's late October here, almost November. So just, what is that, like seven months ago, eight months ago, something. Yep, beginning of the pandemic. (laughs) What's that? Beginning of the pandemic. Yes, yes. You've got a lot of content for just having started this earlier this year. Yeah, I started writing, I think, a year or two ago, because when I first got the idea, I'm one of those people who starts something and then gives up on it. So it was sort of, oh, I'm going to, quote unquote, do this, but I really didn't think I would. So whenever something related to grief happened, I'd write it down and I'd write about how I felt and how I got through it. And At the beginning of March, so the pandemic was just starting and schools were starting to close down um, in the United States. And I remember thinking, I need to do this. I I actually need to do this because there are going to be a lot of grieving teens and I need to I need to go ahead and do this. So I rushed and I finished and I published, I think, quite a few articles at the beginning before I uh, had even released the website. And then I released it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there pre-pandemic, there are always a certain number of teenagers who are going to be grieving every year because sadly, a certain number of, you know, people are going to lose parents or maybe other close people to other causes of death. And when you add the pandemic on top of this, all of a sudden there's, I mean, more grief, there's more loss, there's a higher percentage of people than before who need a, a resource like this. Yeah, so I was hoping I could be that resource and be there yeah. for people who yeah. might be feeling that way soon. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, well, so what are some of the of the topics that you tackle on the site? Um, I talk about a lot of things. Most of the things I publish are stories uh, from my personal life about things related to grief. And then at the end, I usually give some advice about how I got through the situation and how I'm doing. Grief affects everything. I mean, I think a lot of people think that grief is just something you feel when you're laying in bed at night and, you know, or wake up in the morning and you just think of that person, but then the rest of the day, you're okay. And that's not true. Grief is 24, seven, 365 days a year, again and again. And because of that, my articles talk about everything because grief affects everything. Um, I especially talk about school, what it's like to be in school grieving, what's like going back to school after you lose a loved one and how you can, you know, keep going in school and not fall behind. I've talked more about the coronavirus because obviously we can't do normal after death rituals like funerals. And it's different when you can't be with people um, when you're grieving. And that's just something we haven't gone through before and something I'm going through with everyone else. I talk about the side effects of grief, for example, um, loneliness and not being able to sleep. A lot of people think that grief is just, oh, I miss this person. But in reality, it's, you know, I can't sleep. I can't function. I can't do any of this stuff. It affects everything. And the final big topic I talk about are life changes because I lost my dad. So obviously my life was thrown upside down. I, my parents were divorced. So I lost half of my life and it was very different. And that was, that was difficult when grieving someone, just all those changes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned school and and how grief affects that. And I know you had a post about talking to teachers about grief and and about your loss or the you know the loss that is, is someone in your position, a high school student. Um, can you share with us some tips? I think the post talks about like you know some reasons maybe you should tell them, some maybe reasons maybe you might not want to tell them, and some tips maybe for for talking with teachers about that. 
Yeah. So when my dad died, I was in school. And so I had to tell my teachers just because I was missing school. And when I came back, I was not on top of things. And I'm really glad I told them at the beginning, I would recommend you definitely tell teachers when you first lose someone, just because, for example, I miss school. And instead of, you know, giving me a ton of work, when I came back, my teachers slowly worked with me so I could get back to where my class my classmates were and teachers checked in on me and they made sure I was okay and I didn't have to deal with the stress of having a lot of makeup work uh, when I came back to school which was very nice um, it's difficult though the next year I went back to school and I realized okay I don't think any of these teachers know my dad died do I tell mm-hmm. them mm. um, so I had to take a while and think about it. So I came every year, I came up with uh, a list that I use of reasons to tell them or not to tell them. So if you want to tell your teacher, um, there are three reasons why you should. Uh, first of all, if the loss affects your schooling. So for example, for me, I missed a lot of school. And when I came back, I didn't do well at first, just because studying was the last thing I was talking about. Because my teachers knew about that, I was able to retake tests. They would come in and work with me um, separately, and I really needed that. So if it's affecting your schoolwork, definitely tell your teachers. Or also, if you think it might, like if it did in previous years, maybe just say, hey, just so you know, this might happen. Um, Also, if the loss is recent. I said before, um, I'm so glad I told my teachers right when my dad died because even if I hadn't been behind in school, they were very supportive and they were there for me. And a lot of them checked in on me and I really needed that support at school because I wasn't only supported at home, I was supported everywhere I was. Um, And the final reason is even if the loss isn't recent, even if it doesn't affect your schoolwork, you can just tell them if you want to. It's okay to just say, hey, you know, you're one of my favorite teachers and I thought you should know this part of my life. And that's, that's completely okay. Mm. At, the, at the same time, though, there are a few reasons when you shouldn't tell a teacher. Um, so if you do not want to tell them and it doesn't affect your schoolwork, then you don't have to tell them. That's OK. Um, and the other reason you may not want to is if you don't feel comfortable, which if you just don't feel comfortable around a teacher and it doesn't affect anything related to school, there's no reason why you need to. It's completely up to you. Now, when you're telling a teacher There are a few things you should remember. Um, Obviously, like I said a minute ago, you can tell a teacher without a reason. It doesn't need to affect school. Um, You can just do it because you want to. Um, But even if you don't want to tell a teacher and the loss affects your school, you probably should. Just because if my teachers hadn't known, I would not have done well in my first year of high school. And things would have been a lot harder. And even if you don't really like a teacher that much, they can make life a bit easier for you. Other thing is, you don't have to tell all your teachers. It's not all or nothing. Last year, I told five of my eight teachers. And I didn't need to tell the rest of them, and I didn't even need to tell those five. Um, But I chose to, and I wanted to. Um, And also, you can wait to tell them. Um, At the beginning of the year, it's really stressful trying to figure out who, you know, if you like a teacher, if you don't like them, and figuring out on top of that if you want to tell them this big thing about you. you don't need to figure that out right away. I told one of my teachers in January, and I think another one of them brought it up in March or something. Um, and that's okay. And I'd had them for months beforehand, and it didn't matter that I hadn't told them right away. Mm-hmm. Um, also, so if you if you want to tell a teacher, some advice I have for you um, about how to tell them. Um, you can do an email or just in person. Um, if you're doing it in person, I recommend doing it when no one else is around like before or after school or before or after class and if I were you I would mention who died when they died what you need for example if it loss is recent and you're going to be missing school maybe you need a little extra time with work and if it affects your school at all that makes a lot of sense yeah okay thank you for for going through that with us um because I think that's one of the things that people wonder about particularly as the loss gets a little farther in the past right do I tell yeah new teachers each year do I not how do I handle this so thank you yeah. for sharing your thoughts with us on that and and I'll put a link in the show notes to the the piece that you wrote about that too because people might want to go back and um and read that or maybe share it with somebody yeah. so um yeah okay terrific while we're on the topic of school and other people and talking with other people how about the topic of peers classmates friends support awkwardness um you know 
thoughts around that? And I know you have a piece for tips for those friends who might want to be helpful. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, the th- when, when my dad died, I noticed that a lot of my friends were weird. Now, when I say weird, I, don't, I mean, like some of them didn't talk to me at all, and which was weird, <laughs> obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them would just avoid a lot of subjects. Some of them would just try to make me laugh. And some of them would just be really sad around me. And the thing is, at first I thought, oh my gosh, my friends hate me. <laughs> and I couldn't uh. figure out why they were acting so strange. And then I realized um, before my dad died, I knew nothing about grief, absolutely nothing. And after he died, I also didn't know much until I started reading online and my friends still didn't know anything. Uh. So when your friends act weird or say weird things, they're not doing it because they're mad at you or upset at you or don't want to be around you anymore. It's because they don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I have this piece I wrote on my website about 23 things I wish people knew about teenage grief. And I wrote that because I realized my friends had no idea what I was going through. And because they didn't know, they couldn't properly be there for me. Um, I have a lot of them on here, but a few of the big ones um, for friends are someone doesn't know what the person who's grieving may not know what they're going through and why they're feeling it. Usually Mm -hmm. when someone's sad, you go up to them and you say, why are you sad? And how can I help you not be sad? And you expect them to know that answer. When my dad died, I was just as confused as everyone else. I couldn't tell you what I was feeling. And I definitely could not tell you how to make me feel better because I just had absolutely no clue. Um, So it's not like the person's hiding the answer (laughs) from you. Um, They don't know either. Also, something my friends did that was unhelpful, but at the same time I knew they were trying to help, is they didn't talk about my dad. Dad mm-hmm. became like a curse word. Like no one would say it around me. I remember sometimes people be like, oh, my dad. <gasps> oh my gosh. Like, like <sighs> and it happened a few times. And at first I thought, okay, they're weird. And then I realized <laughs> they thought that if they didn't talk about my dad, I would be feel okay. Uh, let, me, let me just say this. I was thinking about my dad all the time. If they brought him up, I was probably already thinking of him. And them bringing him up didn't make me feel worse. It made me feel better. Because the thing is, my dad was all that I was thinking about. And when no one else would talk about him, it made me feel like they had all forgotten about him and that I was the only one feeling this way. So it's okay to just bring up their loved one and even bring up their grief. Something a few of my friends start doing is asking me questions. And I think. Like at the the beginning, I really didn't know what I was feeling, but a few weeks in, my friends would say, oh, I'm going to do this. Do you think this will be helpful? Or, hey, how are you feeling? And sometimes the person may not have the answers, but at the same time, I was able to say, oh, it's really helpful when you do this, or it's not helpful when you do this, or I don't even know. And just communicating about how a person's feeling is really important. And it didn't make me feel upset. It made me feel uh, a lot better. Yeah. Um, Something else that's not in my article is that when we, we, um, when we all um, encounter a problem, it's our first in- instinct to try to fix it. Mm. The thing is, you cannot fix grief. There's absolutely nothing you can say, nothing you can do, anything that will make this situation better. So don't go into it trying to fix it. Instead, just when you talk to a friend, try to support them say, you know, what can I do for you? Um, If they don't know, something my friends did that I absolutely love is they guessed. And I know you may not want to guess because you think you might do something wrong. Like my friends didn't talk about my dad. That was wrong. But at the same time, I felt loved because I realized they were taking a lot of effort to do that. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. It just matters you're doing something. Um, Also, something else, some advice for friends. Um, If your friend is distant, it's not your fault. Grief changes everything. And I remember the day my dad died. I texted my friends. I was like, my dad died and <laughs> didn't really say much else. Um, and they were all texting me and texting me. Um, and I didn't respond. And it wasn't that I didn't care about them or anything. It was that time was weird and I was tired and I just couldn't cope with that. Like just having to answer all these messages. And it was like that for the next few weeks. So if your friend is distant, it's okay 
you, you still reach out to them, still tell them you care, but it has absolutely nothing to do with you. Uh, so if you're one of those friends who has a, <clears throat> excuse me, a friend who's had a loss and they're not responding to your text, not to think, oh, I did something wrong or, oh, I shouldn't bother them, but to realize that they may be overwhelmed or any number of other things and keep reaching out and not worry if you're not hearing back. Yeah. The thing is, every message means something. Mm. Like, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I remember every single person who sent me a message, but I cannot tell you what they told me. Ah. So it matters more that you just reach out, say something. If you don't know what to say, say, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. The thing is, like, I, I think I remember probably four people who said something, but I remember all of the hundreds of other people who even just said, I'm sorry, because just knowing that they took time out of their day to say, I'm sorry, and to even be there for me afterward means a lot. Mm, yeah. So they're basically by reaching out at all, they're sending a message, I'm here and I care, regardless yeah. of what they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Thank you for telling us about that. <laughs> um, let's see. And oh, and so I'll put the post also in the show notes about 23, 23 things I wish people knew about teen grief, because I think that's an important one. And I hope people will read it and share it. Um, and also the post about supporting grieving friends that you have as well. Um, mm-hmm. There'll be a lot of links for this, uh, <laughs> this episode here. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see. Oh, okay. Well, speaking of posts, um, you have another one where you talk about taking driver's ed class and you were excited. And then uh, can you tell us about how this whole experience was for you? So like any kid, I've always looked forward to getting my driver's license just being able to drive on my own or even be able to drive when I got my permit was just this exciting thing to me. And finally, I, when I was old enough to get my, uh, to go to driving school and then get my license, I was thrilled because I was, I thought that, you know, oh, getting a license is so exciting. So then everything leading up to it is going to be really exciting, including driving school. Mm. So when I was old enough, my mom signed me up and I went to driving school for the first time. It was six hours long. And about 20 minutes in, I'm sorry, this is a spoiler to anyone who has not gone to driving school. uh, It was so boring. It was just, (laughs) yeah. I I sat there and I thought, how could I think this would be exciting? And Uh I was stuck there for another five and a half hours. Wait, the six hours was in one day? Not like... Like six or five. It it was long. Wow. Wow. Okay. Actually, I don't know. It may have, it was between four and six hours. I don't remember. It felt like six hours. Yeah. Okay. But it wasn't like an hour a week or something like it was was a long long. session. Okay. Yeah. It was so long. And I I had such high expectations too when I went and I thought this would be really exciting because, you know, driving was so exciting. And I remember just sitting there and thinking, oh my gosh, this is horrible. You know, (laughs) Uh it was so boring. Uh Uh, So finally at the end, the instructor said, okay, for next 30 minutes, for last 30 minutes, we are going to be watching videos. Now, when teachers in school say we're going to be watching a video in class, that means the class is going to be really fun. Uh-huh. Like you sit there, you watch some guy singing about science <laughs> or something, uh, and yeah. it's just an entertaining class where you don't really have to do much. Mm. I was, I started getting excited again. I thought, oh, you know, maybe it was just the beginning that was boring. You know, the last 30 minutes is going to be really good. Mm. And I, I was excited. I thought, oh, we're going to learn, you know, some, someone's going to sing to us about stop signs or something. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And then the instructor turned on the video and my expectations were, again, crushed. We watched what were supposed to be scare tactics. And what I mean by that are they were videos that were meant to scare us into being a good driver. Mm. I In these videos, there were graphic videos and photos of car crashes, which were horrible. My dad had just died a little over a year beforehand. But what affected me the most actually wasn't those. But after we would see the videos and photos, their family members would be interviewed. Um, and they'd talk about their grief and how sad they were. And normally when I heard about other people who were grieving, I felt less alone. I felt a lot better. But in that situation, I just felt horrible. I couldn't breathe. And I felt like, you know, the room was coming in on me and I was surrounded by 40 other kids. So I couldn't just get up and leave. And I felt trapped. Mm. And afterward, about 30 minutes later, I ran out to my mom's car and just started sobbing. And it was really hard. And at the moment, I thought that I had no, nothing that I could do. I had I couldn't do anything. I just had to sit there and watch the videos. And looking back, there was so much I could have done. 
And being that was the first time I'd ever really been triggered by grief in public. And it's happened many times since. And it's not just driving school. For, um, it happens everywhere. And you can't really control it. And you can't predict it. Mm. There's no perfect way to deal with it. But something that helps me is by making a general plan ahead of time of what to do. It's a lot easier to figure out what to do when you have a little plan that you can adapt a tiny bit than it is when you have absolutely nothing. So my plan, personally, I have two for in public and in school, just because school's a bit different. So in public, if I can't leave I, the situation, I distract myself, I get on my phone or text a friend. If I can leave, I'll leave <laughs> and then call a friend or listen to music. If you're in school, it's a bit different. Um, so I'll try to distract myself or look away. Um, if it's continuing, I'll talk to my teacher and try to figure out if there's something else that I can do besides this. And worst case, um, I've never done this, but I could, I know I could walk out of the class. And mm. if I did that for anyone who might do that, don't wander away, just stand outside of the door <laughs> because, and then when the teacher comes out, just explain why. Um, personally, I, at my school, I know if I explained why and said, oh, I'd be happy to do something else besides this, that my teachers would have been understanding. This, especially from making that plan and looking back, I know you always have options, even if you don't feel like it. When I was in driving school, I could have distracted myself. I could have not looked at the videos and not listened to them. And I also could have talked to my instructor and found something else that I could have done <laughs> related to driving. But I didn't realize that in the moment, even though it's so obvious to me now so it's really important that you make a plan yeah yeah okay thank you for sharing that with us i i had no idea that driver's ed might include content like that that could be triggering yeah. so i think just um you know hearing about your experience with this i hope that parents excuse me parents or teenagers who are listening who maybe driver's ed is coming up you know in the next few years here will will think about that and remember that and make a plan for um for dealing with that if it comes up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you. And for sharing the tips, um, because I think those are some really helpful suggestions, which then brings me to my next point. Um, and so you've probably covered some of these, but you have another post called 48 ways to cope with teenage grief. I'm assuming some of the things you just mentioned about distraction, um, stepping out and things are part of that. Are there a few others that um, might be good for us to know about? Yeah. So something that now a lot of people seem to realize is that Teenagers, especially when they go through their first loss, don't know how to cope with grief. When my dad died, I didn't know what to do. I started trying to ignore my grief because I genuinely thought that was a good coping mechanism, which it is not. Do not do that. It makes things a lot worse. And I wish I had just had a list of things I could have done. So if you are grieving, even if you're not a teenager, there are many positive ways you can cope with grief. So something I do is I write my feelings. I share posts online about my grief and the way I format them, which really helps me is I tell a story about something happened. Uh, for example, the driving school story that I just told. And then at the end, I give advice, like how I made my plan. And it's easier to write like that for me because I realized afterward that, oh, look, I went through this hard thing, but I got through it. And this is how I can get through it again in the future. So I recommend writing like that. Mm. Another thing that I do um, is when I'm having a hard time, I get out my phone and I start recording a voice memo and I talk about what I'm feeling. Often just talking myself through my feelings helps a lot. Um, something else you could do is just call a friend and talk to them. But I often find that just sitting and recording myself talking, that at the beginning I'm feeling really stressed and overwhelmed, but by the end I sort of realize that I'll be okay and talk to myself through it. Yeah. Something else I recommend is talking to people, like I said a minute ago. Um, but some something that I did that really helps me that may not may not apply to others, but I had a really good school guidance counselor and I talked to him a lot. Whenever I was feeling upset, I went down to his office and he was very helpful. Um, obviously, not everyone has a great uh, guidance counselor, but there are probably adults in teenagers' lives who they can talk to, like their parents or guidance counselor, teachers, anyone. Um, and finally, my last uh, my last coping, me uh, <laughs> coping mechanism that I use is going online and looking up other people who have grieved. That may seem weirdly, I especially look up celebrities too, because 
because it's easier with celebrities just because their whole life is online. Yeah. Um, but just seeing, oh, look, they went through this horrible loss and they're doing okay right now. This is how they got through it. Oh, maybe here's some music or a video they made about it. It's nice to see that I'm not alone. And especially with famous people, again, like everything's online. So <laughs> you can learn quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll link that post too. Uh, Cause you know, you've got 48 suggestions in there. So that's, <laughs> yeah. That, thank you for going through those. That's really terrific. Um, and it reminds me, you mentioned going online. Um, there's also, you talk about, uh, I think you have three or four or five different of your favorite online resources uh, besides your own website, of course, <laughs> other, <laughs> other online resources. Uh, can you tell us about a few of your favorites that people might want to know about? Yes. So three of my favorite websites that I started looking at just a few weeks after my dad died are the Dougie Center, Modern Loss, and What's Your Grief? Mm. Um, a lot of, so Modern Loss is aimed at adults mostly, but there I found that I could relate to a lot of the posts. Um, What's Your Grief has articles for both um, kids and adults, and the Dougie Center is mostly for grieving kids. All three of them have really good <laughs> articles and resources for grieving teens that have helped me a lot. Um, I also look at the Aluna Network, and they have an amazing resource database where basically you can type in uh, like your age range and what you need. So for example, I type in that I'm a teenager and I'm looking for grief resources and they, they have this huge list of grief resources, which ah. I found really helpful and it's easy to find things on there. Uh -huh. And finally, uh, I, I read a lot of the grief reality. It's a blog created by two sisters who are young adults and they lost their mom. And it's interesting because they're not teenagers, but at the same time, I relate to a lot of what they're going through and I love their work. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Okay, good. Well, I will link all of those in the show notes too. And um, I agree. Those are terrific resources and I've actually had a number of them on this show as well. So I'll put mm -hmm. the links um, to those. And I know you've been interviewed on the Dougie Center's podcast, Grief Out Loud. And so I'll encourage people to listen to that as well. And I'll put a link yes. to that in the show notes too, because that's a terrific discussion you have with Jana for that. Um, okay. Awesome. This is just, this is terrific. Um, well, you know, the other thing I was thinking about, I guess one more, one more question here. I noticed on your website, you have a section where other teenagers can submit some a story or something can you tell us about that i have a page on my website called share your grief and i found that sharing my story and hearing stories from others is powerful because peer support is so helpful and i want my website to be a platform where people can share their stories and then read stories from a, a, a diverse group of people and I'm trying to broaden the website's voice out just because it's currently me right now. So if you are going through teenage grief, have went through teenage grief, or even know a grieving teenager, I encourage you to make a written or multimedia submission. And multimedia is just art, music, basically anything besides uh, written. And if you submit it, you can potentially get featured on the Teenage Grief Sucks website. If you're interested in that, you can go to teenagegriefsucks.com backslash share. Okay, cool. And so this and so this is for anybody who's 13 and over, is it? Yes, 13 over, but if you're under 18, I will need parental permission. Sure, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and just to reiterate, um, it could be a written essay or story, but it also could be other forms of creative expression that are grief-related? Yes, I accept anything. Awesome, great. Okay, are there any sorts of deadlines or is this just like an ongoing thing? This is an ongoing thing. Awesome. Okay, good. Well, I hope that people who are listening uh, will take a look at that and consider because I think it's a it's a great opportunity, I think, to be part of something that's really helpful to other teenagers. Um, I think it's a unique resource. I don't I haven't seen anybody else doing something like you're doing. Have you have you come across anything like this? Uh, I think there's one, but they stopped publishing a few years ago, slapped. They did. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I meant to look into that, but I got the impression they had stopped. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, good. Well, I'm glad you're doing this and bringing this resource now um, because I think you have a lot of um, stories, perspectives, ideas that, you know, that you're sharing. And it's, it's, it's so generous of you to share your experiences with all of us so that we can learn, um, you know, from your experience and hopefully other teenagers can you know, learn from, from what you're doing and maybe have a little bit, I don't know, at least feel like they're not so alone and learn a few things in the process. 
Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and the other thing for parents, I have to say, I think it's, uh, if anybody who's listening is a parent, I would encourage them as well to look at, um, at the stories and the content on your site. Because I think as parents, we're trying to figure out how we can help our kids and our teenagers. Um, and like speaking for myself, I, I know, you know, my experience is losing a spouse. My experience is not losing a parent. Even though, you know, my kids and I lost the same person, we lost a different relationship to that person. And so it makes the experience very different. Um, not that one is easier or harder or better or worse or whatever. It's just that it's it's different. And so I think, you know, talking with people like you and um, reading the essays you've written and stuff helps us as parents as well, just to get some ideas maybe of, of what the teenage grief experience is like so we can better support our own kids um, as, you know, as they're going through this as well. So that's a long winded way of saying, thank you for doing this. <laughs> um, terrific. Okay. Well, um, I know I said one last question on the last one, but this is really the very last question is kind of a wrap up uh, comment. I wonder if you could say one thing to teens who are grieving, uh, losing a parent, what would you say to them? So I feel like I had a hard time coming up with an answer to this question because I feel like people usually say one of two things it gets better, or you are not alone. Mm. And while those are nice things to say, I've, I remember at the beginning of my grief, people always said that to me. And I've heard other people talk about this too, but I knew those things. I knew things would get better, except for a few moments of hopelessness. I always saw my life going uphill eventually. And I remember I looked up that approximately one in five kids go through grief. So I knew that I was not alone. And I realized I've, I've gotten further in grief. I realized there's something that I wish people had said to me. So to anyone who is grieving, I just want to tell you, you can ask for help. I always felt like when people told me to be strong and that I was so brave and all these things, that it meant that I had to be quiet and had to act like I was okay. I thought there was strength in silence and there isn't. In reality, it takes so much strength to admit to yourself that you're not okay and then reach out and get help. And reaching out to people and getting help doesn't can mean a lot of things. It means, you know, you can talk to your friends, you can talk to your families. Um, it's also okay to get professional help. And I wish people had told me that, but there's nothing wrong in admitting your weaknesses and realizing that you're not okay. Well, it's actually, it's not a weakness admitting that you're not okay. It's a strength. Yeah. It's hard to yeah. do. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you for sharing that with us. I think, and actually, I think that's a great place to end here. So, um, so my guest today is Natalie Adams, who lost her dad when she was a freshman in high school, and she now runs the website Teenage Grief Sucks. So Natalie, can you tell us where can listeners find your website and find you on social media? So if you want to see the Teenage Grief Sucks website, you can go to teenagegriefsucks.com. And if you want, if you want to see us on social media, uh, it's at Teen Grief Sucks on Twitter, Pinterest, and Tumblr. Okay, fantastic. Well, Natalie, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Natalie Adams as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 89. And a shout out today to all the parents out there who are raising teenagers. I hope that you found something interesting in our discussion today. And I hope you've also had a chance to listen to episode 13, where I interviewed Dr. Lisa Damore. And in that episode, we talked especially about her book about raising teenage girls, although her work is relevant for both girls and boys, particularly her brand new podcast called Ask Lisa, which if you haven't had a chance to check that out yet, I would definitely recommend that. It's actually geared uh, at parents with kids whether they're children, small children, medium-sized children, or teenagers. Um, terrific work there. And Lisa's book, uh, Untangled, Guiding Teenage Girls Through the Seven Transitions into Adulthood. Super book. Very worth reading um, if you have a teen or tween daughter. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, um, big thank you to an, someone who wrote an iTunes review that just came in the other day. It's from someone named Sue. And it's, uh, the subject is Great Resource for Soul Parents. And it says, This podcast is an amazing resource for widowed parents, whether new to this reality or having been soul parenting for years. Incredible insights and compassionate work. 
So thank you very much, Sue. I really appreciate you taking a few minutes to write that. And um, I think it's one thing that I didn't realize before I started podcasting is that the reviews actually are really helpful uh, in terms of helping more people find the show the more reviews there are. So if you're listening and you haven't had a chance to go over to Apple Podcasts and leave a short review, I would I would love that and I would appreciate that as, as would other people who are able to find the show because of your review. So uh, that is all for now. As always, thank you for listening. And until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.